everybody. This is Donna Anderson, author of lovefraud.com. And tonight I have a special guest. This is Tracy Malone, who is the founder of Narcissist Abuse Support. And she also has come out with a book recently called Divorcing Your Narcissist. There it is, which is got lots and lots and lots of good tips in it. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So welcome, Tracy. Thank you for having me. Okay. So I have some questions for you. First of all, why did you decide to write your book? Well, I went through a horrific divorce and had a lot of tactics pulled on me. I didn't know I was divorcing a narcissist, therapists, lawyers, nobody mentioned that. And so um, the more I worked with clients, the more I saw patterns. I'm like, people need to know this. And I literally would write like little post-its while I was with a client. I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. Well, that's the 85th time I've heard that this week. And I'm like, oh, that's good. That's good. And you know, I never planned on being a writer. I, I, I was terrible in school. I just started putting this together. And as I built my site over these last years, I got more confident in my writing. And uh, the more I wrote, the more it just poured out. And it was like almost divine. I would be like, thank you, God. That was a great line. Where'd that come from? <laughs> it was just coming to me while I was writing. And it took like two and a half years to gather the data. You're a big data collector. I did, you know, surveys on my website. I got people to, to submit their tricks. And honestly, they were extremely scary tricks. And I didn't want people to read tricks and have them go, oh, I can't read this, trigger, trigger, trigger. So I wanted them to not only know what could be, you know, happen to them, but what to do if this happens. Mm -hmm. Because if we are aware, we literally can prepare. If we are blindsided like me, I just never wanted anyone else to be blindsided. Right. Yeah, I know exactly. Because I had um, my own divorce. Although actually mine was lucky in the sense that my ex-husband just bailed out. <laughs> he stopped participating. So uh, I, I, having read your book, I saw some of the tricks that you endured. Um, I saw some of them, but mostly he just disappeared. So, so in my case, it was kind of lucky. But anyway, so what do you think are the top three concepts that people who are divorcing a narcissist need to understand? Well, I think they need to know that they were a victim of abuse, right? Because until you actually hear the words, learn about the tactics, you're stuck in this, well, well who does this? How could this be happening, right? Until you see it and learn that part, you're not going to be able to proceed with the healing portion of it, right? You'll get through the divorce just fine like I did, but you'll still be reeling and it would have been a lot harder to not understand that this was something that was done to you in a way. Um the other concept that I would say people have to realize is that this is not going to be an easy divorce, right? You just mm -hmm. said you had a nice easy one because he left and, and didn't come back, right? That's pretty rare. Like if, especially if there's children involved, it's always a battle. It's always a war and, and, and lawyers call it high conflict. You know, they don't care what we call them as far as, you know, their, their personality disorder. They just know it's going to be high conflict and the cost for people is going to be shocking. And mm -hmm. so, it's not going to be easy. It's going to cost a lot. Get used to that concept because the concept that, um, you know, that we'll get through this really easily and it will go to mediation. It'll be fine. I <laughs> wish you luck. I, I have seen at least two people that that has worked for. So, um, you know, just know that. And, and the other concept is that it's going to take a village. It's going to take a team. You're going to end up with a lawyer. You may end up in mediation. Many states require mediation before you can get a divorce. So you'll have that legal team, but you'll also need a financial team. And specifically if you have some assets, you've got things like a company together, you have rental properties, you've got things that you might not even know that your spouse has retirement here or this or that. You've got to have someone almost like a financial detective that is going to do it so that when the offer comes through, that you know that everything is on the table, right? Forensic accountants are often called in, but they aren't necessarily needed on a lot of the cases unless there's that stuff. Um, and then, of course, the, the mental health piece of the team is to know that you're going to need a therapist. Having a coach, someone like me, that can guide you through when they do something, when they do this, we do that. Like A therapist wouldn't know that. But mm -hmm. someone like a coach that does this all the time with the, oh, that's what narcissists do. 
strategies are going to help you get through it. Does that mm-hmm. make sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So what would you say is the biggest misconception that people have when they're about to divorce a, a narcissist? Uh, that they didn't know who they were married to. Mm -hmm. everything that they thought the person was is going to unravel right here the mask has been dropped and um this isn't going to be fair this isn't going to be um something they're not going to be fair with the money and the distribution so you're going to have to fight for that even though you're entitled to it by law and um you know you can try mediation you can try whatever you want but know that if things are not going well, say in mediation, and I've had clients going, you know, 15, 20 times and not ever get settled. And so, you know what, we're walking away. This, this isn't working. We, we have to take it to the next level. Don't waste your time going 10, 15 times, because unless you're actually going, we're working on this, we got to page one on this one, let's go back to this one here, right? If you're not making progress, walk away from mediation, you tried it, just take the, the bite and go to the court and, and let a judge decide. You know, narcissists don't like that. So um, they will probably, uh, you know, sort of retaliate if you go into court. But instead of sitting here wasting, I I talked to a client I worked with two years ago today. um, And two years ago, I worked with her and she was one that had at least five months of mediation. Uh And two years later, she called me back and she's like, it ain't over yet. Uh (laughs) Two years later, my God, right? So just put on your patience hat and know that it will end one day. Right. And the the whole thing about mediation, though, is that mediation works when the two parties want to come to an agreement, but the narcissists don't. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, their objective in many cases is to just, you know, drag it out and drag you through. In fact, one of their strategies is to keep dragging things out so that they bleed you of all your money and you can no longer afford to fight. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. They would rather spend money on lawyers than give you one penny. Like it doesn't matter. They will battle. They will call child protective services. They will do this. They will do all of these tactics to wear down your money and wear down your strength, right? This is their goal. 100%. Yes. Get all the money and all that stuff too. Right. But it is really to, to wear you out. And if, if you give in and if you don't fight, whether it's for money or for your children's rights, then the poison worked. (laughs) They are Mm going to be sitting there and like putting their hands together. Yay. You know, if you walk away from something and so you'll use your lawyer to find out where to go with this and make those decisions at that time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, early in your book, you discussed the concept of planning for the fear of divorce. So explain that and and how it could help people to really look that straight on. Sure. So like I put that at the beginning of the book because every client that comes into my Zoom room is riddled with fear. What's going to happen next? How will I survive financially? What will happen to my kids? How can I pay for a lawyer? I don't even have a deposit for a lawyer. The fear just grips them, right? And what I find is and I did it too. Um, Many people build the story around the fear, right? And and I'm going to give you a quick example. When I was going through my divorce, my biggest fear was how will I financially survive? How will I make it? I lost my retirement in this. I've lost my savings. Everything was gone. And I'm sitting here, how will I survive? So the story that my brain, and I've got PTSD from this, my brain was like, I'm going to be an 80 year old woman cleaning the schools late at night and microwaving cat food, right? And so that was like, like my thing. Not only did I think it inside, but I actually said it to my friends. That's my fear I'm so afraid of. And what that was doing was re-injuring me every time I'd say it. And so that fear was crippling me and my catastrophizing skills just built it into something really big. And so we have to learn that facing our fears is much better than hiding from them. Because when you're in PTSD, it's so easy to go back under the covers and go, I don't know what's out there. I don't want to see it. Right. But when you can actually face the fears and answer some like questions about it and learn that it's more frightening to not face the fear but by facing it and going okay 
if this is my financial like fear, what can I do about it? Um, what's the truth about it? How do I process this so that it doesn't take away my energy? Because in this divorce, while you're weakened anyway, you don't need a fear taking you down. Yeah. Okay. So what are some of the strategies that you suggest for planning for the fear? Well, The first thing is to write them out. I'm a very big proponent to get out your pen and don't just sit there like half, just pick pick up a journal, write it down. What are your biggest fears? And I created these worksheets that I'll show you in a second because Mm -hmm. I was laying in my bed on my giant king size bed with this giant like post-it pad. (laughs) And when I would wake up in the middle of the night, I would write on the post-it pad, turn on the light and start writing. And I started writing these steps processing that fear, Tracy, what do you need to do? Like I was coaching myself on the giant piece of paper. And Mm -hmm. so looking at the fear and looking at, um, you know, listing it, what's the worst case scenario, write it out, Tracy, you're going to eat cat food and be, you know, sweeping the school. Okay. What's the reality of that potentially coming true? I don't know. I'm just scared of it. Right. All right. Well, the the reality is it might not happen. And then what can I do to not let it happen is I'm going to work my butt off until I'm as old as I have to be until I can financially take care of myself. I I vowed to build myself back out of that hole that I had the divorce had caused. I had a hundred thousand dollar divorce and we were fighting over 25. So all that, all of it went to the 25 went to the lawyers too. I never saw it was in escrow right so like what am I going to do now like I'm still in this battle and it's costing write out your fears what's the reality that that's going to happen what can you do to stop that from happening and um you know what's the proof just what is the proof that this could happen well there isn't any proof that's my mind okay Mm -hmm. let's relax let's calm um and I have these sheets and I'll 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 send you a link I'll I'll tell them the link in a second but then I I did the next part was when do I remember feeling this before was it just now because of the divorce? And I'm writing this down and I'm like, hmm, you know what? My parents used to tell me I better marry well because I'm so stupid. I'll never oh. do anything. They were narcissists. So of course they were limiting me down, but that's the recording in my head. So maybe this fear isn't just about this. It's, it's actually attached to the other things. And mm-hmm. I'm just sort of making it even bigger. Um, and then like, again, how do we change the story of the fear? Instead of I'm going to eat cat food, rewriting the story in your mind so that you are not triggering yourself every time and and sitting there saying, okay, I'm going to work as hard as I can to make this fear not come true. And am I going to say this is going to work? No, but I'm going to try as hard as I can to keep on that path and know that in the end goal, I'll have retirement and hopefully be okay. But not knowing how to get there, I didn't know, but I had the faith that I will keep on working. And that does it, right? The um, That's called the birth of the fear sheet. And the last one is, and I do this with my support groups, is I can see how fears have. And then you write prompt after that, right? I can see how fears controlled my life, made me pick the wrong people. I'm like, oh my God, that fear was there when I married my husband because mom said you better marry well. Mm-hmm. Oh, I can fix that, right? I don't have to hold this fear anymore and I can start to learn to let it go. So these sheets, you can find them. I'm sure you'll put my URL down there, narcissistabusesupport.com slash fear, and you can download these worksheets. Wow, that's really great. So one of the points that you made in the book is that once the divorce papers are served, the rules change the rules change. So what what do people need to understand about that and exactly what happens and how can they plan for it? Well, when you file for divorce or when a divorce gets filed, um, the narcissistic injury occurs and they're wounded. And so revenge is the first thing on their list. Everything you saw and you thought from this person as a compassionate, nice person is gone. And so um, they lie about all the time people are just like why are they lying why are they doing all this and it comes right out of the gate when they do that they are actually beginning the rewriting of the story process they're they're actually making up a whole false narrative about your life making them into the victim and the hero 
because that's not how it went. And so you defend yourself, going, that's not how it was, you know, but they're already rewriting the story. So expect them to do that instead of be shocked by it. You'll still be shocked at the things they say, but knowing that this is a tactic that they're going to use because a divorce can't be about them, right? Mm -hmm. It's about you because you were the bipolar, like child abusive, whatever, not the people pleasing, do everything for them person. You, now you're the enemy that has stolen all of their money and married them because you're a gold digger. Like whatever their story is, um, it's going to be amplified because that's how they make their case by building this lies. Um, and you can expect them to hide assets, quit their job, um, you know, don't give anything, stonewalling the court, never giving paperwork in. I have, um, my husband was in contempt of court. We had seven trials. Oh, uh, gosh. Seven gosh. trials? Seven trials to fight over my 25,000 and no child and the house was already sold. Why do we need seven trials? One after another, you stole. What did I steal? You haven't given any paper. What, you know, it was a crazy. It was just ridiculous what we went through. But um, in that, he was in contempt six of the seven trials. Why isn't anyone doing anything? He's in contempt. I gave 5,000 papers. Why couldn't he just copy them and hand them in? So our same checking account never occurred to them or they were just being jerks about it. But in the end, with my $100,000 bill, um, I, I had to pull my divorce decree before the book launch. And the, the lawyer said, do you have a gag order? I'm like, what's that? So he sent me my divorce decree again. And um, the, the, the judge did not award me that $100,000 in, in attorney's fees. But he said, he's unable to figure out why, even though there's a paragraph this long in, in the final divorce decree about his being in contempt. Um, he said, like, we don't know how, like Tracy says, it's because he was, he never handed in anything and we kept having to go back to court. And they said, this is classic. And this was 2012. It, they said that the reason it took so long and cost so much money was because it was a witch hunt. Oh. It literally says that in my divorce decree, it was a witch hunt because I was demanding the paperwork that he wasn't giving and he was in contempt for. Like, you can't make that shit up. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> so, again, you know, but again, with his poor me, he quit his very, very good job. He had no money. Poor me. I can't pay her. All the tactics. Then the judge was like, poor guy, you know. Uh, we won't make him pay her legal fees. Clearly, they're both at fault. Both at fault. <laughs> you know, it, it makes no sense. And that's all part of the messaging that people need to understand. The court isn't fair. So Yeah. 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 And also he came from money, correct? Yeah. He came from so he's money. broke now, but he came from money. And, and, the, and the funny part was like, here he was like um, coming to the court and I can't, I quit my job. I can't afford it. Like every time we went to court, it was, she, I can't afford to pay me the temporary support. I quit my job. I have no money. And he's staying in an $800 a night hotel while he's here in Colorado. I'm like, there's something not right here, but he got away with it. Ugh, ugh, ugh. Okay, well, another strategy that I liked that you talk about in your book is your three bucket strategy for crafting what to tell people about the divorce. So, can you explain what your idea is here? Sure. So, if you remember, um, like our story is that we're, we're it triggers us like that we, our story is going to continue to trigger us and the more we tell it um especially when we're sort of in the fire pit of 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 all the divorce when we tell that story um to different people they ask us questions the feedback comes oh no what are you gonna do oh what happened and now your story barfing your story and if you tell every single person that asks you that you're going to go back into trauma like where you might have felt good and then you meet someone at church and you're there to heal and they ask you and you're in the lobby and now you're going in and you're shaking because you've just told the story again so i have been teaching this to my clients for a long time. Let's analyze your friends. Let's make three buckets. The besties, 
maybe if you have healthy, <laughs> responsible siblings and family, they go in there, they get anything that you want to tell them, right? Then you've got a bucket for friends and a bucket for acquaintances. The acquaintances are those church people. I added um, mailman because one of the girls in my support group, I tell my mailman everything. I'm like the poor UPS guy, what? Too much information, right? But church people, work people, neighbors, right? It, it, you do not need to be telling like people that may be like a neighbor the whole story because they might have alliances to your ex. You both live next door to them. And so if you tell them this, you know, horrible, horrific story, not only are you going to get triggered, but it could backfire and they could go right to your ex. So they should always be in there unless they are considered besties, then put them over here. Right. But if you are questioning, like you are friends with the wife and the husband is friends with your husband, well, then that's a risk you want them in the lowest bucket. So you craft almost an elevator speech, an mm -hmm. elevator speech for them, the church people. You know what? Yes, we decided to get a divorce because we've been together so long. We grew apart. It's all good. I'm so excited for my new life. Well, what are you going to do? I don't know, but it's going to be fun. Then you walk into church and you might want to throw up because you just lied. But at the same time, you're not triggered. And that person cannot keep on asking you questions that will go, I don't know how I'm going to survive. Because when you have that, it's going to trigger you. If you have friends that are in that middle bucket that are less than empathetic or unable, like let's not call them unempathetic because they're unable to deal with the trauma and craziness and all of it sounds unreal. And they say things like, oh, everyone gets divorced. You have to just get over it, right? Mm -hmm. They're showing you that they're not worthy to be in bucket middle and you mm -hmm. put them down into there and give them limited information. But the middle people, again, craft a story We've all heard of elevator speeches and it's just sort of like, here's who I am and this is what I do. 30 seconds, bye, right? Mm -hmm. Craft those giving less information from the very bottom to the middle and then besties get everything. And that keeps you safe and it stops you from being triggered over and over. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's really important because, and it's really important as you said in the beginning of this, part of the discussion to really analyze who everybody is and how they can um can they can they really hear everything you know I mean luckily for me I it was, it was kind of strange because I actually became best friends with my um husband's mistress <laughs> you know and uh because like my ex-husband took uh, you know, $227,000 from me. And um, I used to from her. And he took from her too. And actually it was when I called her, you know, and because, I mean, the reason I left my husband was because I found out that he was cheating on me mm -hmm. and uh, had a child with another woman. And, you know, so then when I, I we were in Florida, then, then when I came back here to New Jersey, I start looking through all this paperwork and I'm finding all this stuff going, oh my God. And so I called this woman and I said, I'm Donna Anderson. I'm James Montgomery's wife. And I'd like to suggest that you don't give him any more money. She says, it's too late. I already gave him $92,000, mm -hmm. you know? So, and it turned out she and I teamed up you know, to try and, you know, figure out how to handle this and find out what the truth of it was and everything. So she became the person that I could talk to all the time. Whereas like my family was more in the middle bucket, you know, I could tell them some things, but not many because they, they just, they can't hear it. It's, it's too threatening. And, you know, that's why you have support groups and that's why it's important for people to find others who have been through it because those of us who have lived it and, and know what's going on, I mean, we can hear it and we can be good listeners where other people who don't really understand just can't even do it. They, they just, just don't have the capacity because it's just too threatening. Exactly. And, and I love that you became friends with her. I was reading that chapter of your book this morning. So I knew that, oh wait, it's 97, 90 something. Yes, I read that this morning. So, you know, I, I know that, that that's what happened with you. I became um, good friends with my second narc's next supply, or I thought she was the next supply. Turns out he'd been 
dating her for two of my two and a half years and another one for six months. So basically he never had less than two of us at a time, sometimes three. Mm. She ended up, she was from Australia. I'm like, when the heck did you meet him? Like, when did you see him? Because I was either with me or whatever, right? We actually, she stayed with me that first summer and we became good friends and ended up taking our bucket list to Italy together. But um, we compared calendars. Every time she was here for a week, I was babysitting his child. Oh and gosh. I was getting texts. He's in Chicago. Look at this beautiful dinner I'm having. I wish you were here. Look, it's the picture of the Sear Tower. I wish you were here. And he was down the street in a hotel. Mm. It's like, you can't make that shit up, right? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. finding and actually getting that validation from the next supply, it's so brilliant. It really helps a lot of people. It does. It does. Unless they attack you and they hate you too, which could also. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's that, you know, there's because, you know, if, if they're still in the honeymoon stage, then, then, you they're know, they're believing, you know, what the, the, the uh, narcissist or sociopath is saying to them, then, then you, you, you never know what we're going to get. Yeah. So you have another chapter in your book called finding your inner Sherlock. Now, why is this important? because documentation and and evidence is king, right? You never know what you're going to find. Like just finding money or hidden accounts is absolutely important. If you are not doing it and you leave it to, okay, they submitted their paperwork without ever looking at it, like you have to go over those statements line by line. And many of them are so smart and sophisticated. They've had separate accounts that you'll never even get disclosed here. But when you're looking through the receipt and going, that doesn't, where'd that $10,000 go? It just says withdrawn. Where is it? Now we, we track it and we go here, a paying off of a, a, like a credit card payment for Citibank on your joint account. We never had a Citibank account. Where's that? Give us the statements for that, please. Those are the kind of detective things that if you do, A, they, they realize you're paying attention and B, you get the intel to fight for your life, right? The bank accounts and the things that they're going, like mine never gave anything, right? Um, and we had plenty of evidence, but it, it wasn't what they were doing. So finding that helped me so much. There were a few things in, in ours. On his financial affidavit, he said that he needed a thousand dollar budget for magazines a month. So I went through all of the years, I think it was five years, and there wasn't one magazine on them. So we were able to go back and say, excuse me, but here's the research and there's no magazines. Take that line off, right? He put $6,000 a month for rent to his parents. And I was like, we're like, okay, let's find the evidence. You've never paid that. Isn't that funny? I know you're living there, sir, but is there a lease? Can you show us cancel checks? Er, it's off your list. If you hadn't done that background stuff, you're not going to find the evidence to their lies and to the real financial truth of your, your marriage. Um, my husband had another thing, which I'm just going to tell you, it's a classic. It's in the book. <laughs> he Again, so poor, can't afford to pay me, can't afford whatever. And um, I was still living at the marital home then. And um, you know those little things that are on your keychain? This happened to be for um, DSW shoes, right? So I'm at the marital. Oh, home. A little, a little ticket. Oh, Bob, right. Yeah. And so I'm in the marital home, and the mail's coming, and I'm getting a five dollar coupon from DSW. A ten dollar. I didn't buy shoes. <laughs> $20 coupon. I got almost a thousand dollars in coupons in about six weeks, like a hundred dollar coupon. I'm like, what did he spend to get a hundred dollars? Right. So I, I took that little fob and I was like, I wonder if we have an online account. We didn't, but we had the fob. So I created one and ooh, all the shoes are there. So I print them out. And again, there's shoes for women. There's uh, like it, it just made no sense. And so my lawyer, we printed it out. He's on the stand. My lawyer walks up to him and says, those are very handsome shoes, sir. Are they new? <laughs> no, I've had them for years. Really? Because they look like this piece of paper here. <laughs> and it, it, is that your, it's, this is the shoes, right? Well, well, maybe. Okay. Well then here's all the shoes you've bought in the last month, a thousand dollars or whatever it was like. It was crazy. It was more than a thousand. It had to be $4,000 in shoes. 
So now the judge gets pissed because we gave that evidence, right? Without being the Sherlock and doing that, I would have never had that. Once I had it, the judge ordered him. Like right now, like we had escrow in the lawyer's office. He's like, take his share and give her the money he owes her right now because he's lying to me and I don't like that. Again, evidence is king. Mm -hmm. I know that um, I went through all the bank statements and one of the things that I found was that my uh, ex-husband was withdrawing from different ATM machines in two different countries on the same day. It was like, it's like so obviously somebody else had access to his accounts and was taking money out. So wow. yeah, yeah. So that was one of the And that's why, the, that's why being the detective, as hard as it is to look at this, nobody not even a forensic accountant is going to go this is a normal pay you know he buys a lot of shoes that's just normal right but you're going no right you're going to know what's normal and what's not and it's right. going to give you a rabbit hole for you to demand more um dis discovery more give us those statements show me what's real and um and, and it's just going to give you peace of mind that and also maybe validation wow they he really was like lying this whole entire marriage yeah yeah right so you also mentioned that if through all this research and being a Sherlock, you discover some damaging information about the narcissist or sociopath that you should hold on to it and use it as leverage. Can you explain what you mean by that? Sure. So lots of stuff doesn't ever really make it into court. Um, you know, finding that he, you know, the shoes just happened to work out for us on that particular day because he wore them. But um, at the same time, when you are discovering this information and you call them up, I can't believe you just bought a boat, you know, um, now they can cover it. They can hide it. They, I mean, that was a dumb example, but it came out of my mouth. So whatever it is, they can sit there, deny it and hide it. And, and by the time you come back to court next time, go, that never happened. We don't know what you're talking about, right? But when you have that kind of information um, and you keep it to yourself and your lawyer knows when to pull it out of the hat, this is, again, probably not going to make it on the stand. Let's say your spouse was having an affair, right? That's a big one you know, infidelity. Yeah. Way at the top of the list. Right. So you find out you've got the text, you've called the ex-girlfriend, you know, it was real, right? If you call him up or her up and go, I can't believe you're having an affair cover blown. Like they make a story, they build it, they, they hide it by the time you get to court. If you've kept that secret and your lawyer brings it out, say in mediation and goes, you know, if we go to court, we're going to be disclosing these things know what your narcissist's biggest fears are because fears of being exposed, especially if you're the pastor of a church or you know the deacon of a church that doesn't want it known that they had an affair, oh, I better sign. I'll, I'll agree, right? That's where leverage works. Now your lawyer has to know, some lawyer like, I'm not going to blackmail them. No, it's not blackmailing. It's going, I'm just saying, if we go to court, I got this stuff and I'm not afraid to use it and mm -hmm. let them make the decision to settle. I, I had someone just last week, same thing happened. And like he was protecting his image. That was the most important thing to him. So in that case, she settled. He gave her more than she was asking for. And like obviously evidence that she had the gold. Mm -hmm. And so that's how it helps. Uh, yeah, it, it's so important. And yeah, you know, to know when to use something. And, uh, and actually that's, what that, that that tangentially you brought up a very important point and that is you always got to play your cards close to the vest mm -hmm. i mean you know i mean as much as you want to go and and tell this person i know what you did and and you know you did this and you did this and, and all this other thing i mean you really got to not do that and figure out the most strategic way to use everything that you learn and that you discover about you know the, the sociopath's behavior Absolutely. And, and divorce to a narcissist is a game. And mm -hmm. to win at the game, history must be rewritten and making them into the hero and the victim, right? And so this kind of knowledge that you have with any kind of evidence like this, um, 
pulled out at the right time can make a difference. And sometimes it doesn't. I'm not saying, hey, find the evidence and you know don't plant evidence. But if you've got something and you find it in this Sherlock stuff, then how can we use this? Because our emotions, like you described, our emotions are going to be like, I want to tell him, I want to yell at him. How could you do this? How could you have a baby with someone else, right? I mean, if you came out and started screaming at him, he's going to know the baby's going to be hidden. There's going to be no paper trail. You're never going to be able to prove it. And then he'll still get what he wants. Instead, now we've got a little bit of leverage over him. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. So you also have a very important chapter on what you call narc proofing your divorce decree. So what do you mean by that? Wow, this is probably the most important thing that I wrote. And again, it's it's through lots of clients and lots of um, hearing what happened in court and that sort of thing. Um, narcissists don't necessarily listen to um, orders. Like they're above the law. Um, I went to um, a contempt of court hearing with a friend of mine slash client, and she's like, my lawyer promises it's going to be a shit show. You want to come? And I was like, yes, please. So we sat there, and um, it had been two years since he'd been ordered to pay her, three, sell one of the rental properties and give her $300,000. Two, three, two years later, nothing had happened. She mm -hmm. had filed motions to compel, motions to comply, motions of this, motions of contempt, two years before she gets into court and she'd spent $20,000. So she's up in front of the judge. Her lawyer has a book this big and the narc walks in with three pieces of paper, not copies, not collated. The judge was pissed in the first place, but she's sitting there and the judge is like, okay, sir, you're gonna go to jail if you do not pay her within 30 days. And actually, if you don't pay her immediately. And, and the, the guy was like, he was representing himself. Well, how long would I go to jail for? <laughs> he actually said it. And she's like, at this rate, sir, life until you can pay it. Well, how can I pay it if I'm in jail? That's your problem. You were ordered to do this. Don't mock me. This is a court order, you know. And so her lawyer stands up and says, well, well what do we do? Like, why should she be paying the, the $20,000? Can you please ask that he pay that as well. And the judge put her hands together and was like, I would love to, but it wasn't in the first decree. So I'm in the back row going, it can be in the decree? What does that mean, right? So I talked to her lawyer afterwards and then I, I hired a lawyer to write something. Um, the gray areas of divorce sh of that decree should have said, pay her that money within 30 days, 45, yes. 60 days. No like limits on things, you know, you pick them up, you get them Christmas this year, I get them next year. It's a normal thing. A, a lawyer is going to go, you got it. You got the first Christmas. What are you complaining about, right? Instead, with a, a narcissist, they pick them up. I had an example in the book, picked them up Christmas Eve, didn't bring them back for 12 days till vacation was over. And she called the police. Where's my kids? Oh my God, what are we going to do? And the, and the cops look, looking at the decree going, ma'am, I'd like to, but it doesn't say when he has to bring them back. Right. So when does pickups start? Where are they? You know, what are the rules? This is the most important document of your life, particularly if you've got kids that you are putting all of these things in. Don't just accept Christmas this year, Christmas next year. When does it start? What if, you know, every situation. And while it seems like you want me to go through more details with this guy who won't negotiate, um, Yes, because you pay now or you pay later, right? If you don't think of it now, you'll be like that woman with the $20,000 lawyer bill. Yeah. So if you don't think it through, and there's books on parenting plans, I'm starting a parenting plan um, course that's going to help people go, don't forget this. How about deciding stupid things like when our kid is going to get his driver's license? Who's going to pay for it? Sometimes divorce or parenting plans have things in it that say, you know, mom will buy the, the cell phone for the kids. Okay, well, mom just bought the cell phone. She's the narcissist. And now your kid's eight years old and he dropped it in the toilet. Why don't you have a provision that if in fact kids are kids and they drop or break a phone that we will both then share the second phone cost because it's gonna happen, right? So those gray areas, if you do not define them, they will define your future financially later because you'll be back in court fighting over stupid little things that could have been settled and negotiated on in mediation. These are much more mediation kind of details that you can work on. Yeah, but, you know, it's amazing the lengths that um, some 
narcissist sociopaths will go to. Um, we had a, a woman by the name of a uh, pen name of O. N. Ward um, who wrote um, about her story. And one of the things that happened in her divorce was that um, the, the divorce decree said that alimony was set at, I don't know, $5,000 a month or, or whatever it was. Well, the guy didn't pay. And she says, well, the alimony is $5,000 a month. But the divorce decree didn't say that he actually had to pay the alimony. So. Oh. Oh, the gray area. It didn't say I had to pay it. It just said it was that. Right, right. You have to go to court? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, she had to go in and fight over that. I said, well, it doesn't say anything about paying it. That's, that's exactly how the narcissist thinks. So whether it's your children, like mental health needs, needing braces, they'll just say, no, my kid's fine. And, and there's a reason that they say that because it's a reflection of them. So if their kids at age four need therapy, then somehow they're a bad parent. So again, these kind of decisions will be made here. And the most important one of all of those is what is our um, dispute and conflict like solution? If we cannot agree, first step, we go to a parenting order. Second step, we go to mediation. Third step, we go to court. But if you don't have that, you're gonna be like rushing back to court every time because you don't have a plan along the way. Yeah, yeah. right. Well, Tracy, this has been absolutely fabulous. And uh, I can suggest to anybody who is thinking about or knows that they need to divorce uh, whoever they're with, a uh, sociopath, narcissist, Tracy's got lots and lots of really valuable tips in the book. So I would certainly suggest that folks get it. And um, tell us uh, again where um, they can find your website and where they can get the book. Sure, so you can get the book on uh... Audible, Amazon, Kindle, Barnes and Noble, bookstores are, are picking it up now. That's kind of cool. Um, you can find me, NarcissistAbuseSupport.com. And uh, that worksheet we talked about before is after that, put a, a fear in it. But I want to mention one more thing because your story of the, your, your woman, um, it really, it flagged me to put the part in that chapter of the gray areas that is most vital. I call it, what if they don't clause? Based on what that judge said, I, I was like, I went to another lawyer. I'm like, what, is, what would we say here? And we put it in the book. It is basically that if either party, so it's not just about you, there's always a line about both parties will pay their legal fees, whatever the line and the decision is on that. This one's going to say that if either party doesn't do any of the things up here that they're ordered to do, pay the $300,000, do this, do that, they will pay the legal fees for the other party. Right. Mm -hmm. If we don't include that in the decree, then we will set ourselves up to go back and back to court, but they don't want to spend the money. So they're going to not, it's going to stop them because now they've got to pay two lawyer bills, right? There's no winning for them with that line in there. It, right. it covers if you did something bad as well, but um, they're, they're going to, you know, it can get in there. I've seen it get in there quite a few times. That's great. Okay, Tracy. Well, thank you so much. And uh, to all the Love Fraud Live viewers, thank you for joining us today. And um, as I said, if you're in the situation where you do need to divorce your sociopath or narcissist, then definitely check out her book. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Good night.